Good afternoon. I call to order the meeting of the Metropolitan Council Transportation Committee for August 14th, 2023. Our first order of business tonight is approval of the agenda. I would like to propose one change to the agenda. I would like to take the uh, number six item on the non-consent agenda and move it to our first item, if that's possible. Everyone agrees? Uh, entertain a motion to approve the um, agenda as amended. So moved. moved. Moved by Council Member Chamla, second by Council Member Tony Carter. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the motion carries. Our next order of business is approval of the July 24th, 2023 Transportation Committee mi meeting minutes. There are no changes and additions. I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Moved. Moved by Council Member Cameron. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Tyrone Carter. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And the motion carries. Now we're on to approval of the August 7th, 2023 Special Transportation Committee meeting minutes. If there's no changes or addition, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Moved by Councilmember Vento, second by Councilmember Chambliss. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. And those minutes are also adopted. Now we're on to reports, and we have MTS uh, reports, and we have Amy Benowitz here to report. Uh, Madam Chair, nothing of note to report from MTS today. I would note um, two weeks from now on the Transportation Committee agenda, there are a lot of MTS items, and it's kind of like the, I, I want to say trifecta, but there's four things, and I don't know what the word for that is, but um, so um, we will have a, TPP amendment, we have the regional solicitation release, we have our annual work program, and we have a TIP public comment update. So all of those things coming in one meeting, which is a lot from our end. So prior to that meeting, if anyone wants um, uh, an update on any of those items or wants to ask some additional detailed questions that uh, to prepare you for that meeting, we are more than happy to do that. Good, thank you. Any questions or comments? All right, then we will turn to Metro Transit General Manager Kinderis. Chair Barber, Council Members. Uh, first, I'll just say at tonight you're going to receive an information item that will update you on our latest quarterly service changes that will go into effect on August 19th. Uh, I don't want to get ahead of that good news presentation, but also uh, give you a preview of our state fair service. So um, looking forward to that update tonight. Um, I'll also mention in a future meeting, uh, we're going to bring forward a micro transit update for this group. You might recall back in September of 2022, we launched our first micro transit pilot in Minneapolis. Uh, we have determined we're going to continue that pilot for an additional year. Uh, and so in the coming month or so, you'll receive a more thorough report about uh, the status of that pilot and the work to put together more of a framework for microtransit moving forward. So with that, I'd take any questions. Thank you very much. Any questions or comments? All right. Typically, we now have our TAC Advisory Committee update, but I don't see either David or Daryl here. Uh, we will find out and see if there's an update at a future meeting. Uh, so then, uh, with no other report, we'll move on to our consent items. There are six items on consent tonight. So I'd entertain a motion to approve the items on consent. So moved. Moved by Council Member Cameron. Is there a second? Second. Second by Council Member Carter. Is there any other discussion? We're Council move, Member Chambliss. We're moving six down, right? Um, uh, we're moving six from the non-consent agenda to the first item. Oh, okay. Thank you. There's just six on oh, both okay, sets. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, any other discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay, and the motion carries. So now with our amended agenda, we're moving to business item 2023-180, joint powers agreement with the Metropolitan Airports Commission. And we have Captain, er, Captain Joseph Dasseth and Captain Richard Raymond. Welcome. Chair Barber, council members, good afternoon. My name is Joe Dotseth. I am a captain at the Transit Police, and I oversee the Support Services Division, which oversees a lot of the administrative functions at the Police Department. Chair Barber, council members, Richard Raymond. I am the captain of the Patrol Division for the Transit Police Department. Good afternoon. 
Chair Barber, Council Members, we're here today to talk about business item 2023-180. It's a joint powers agreement with the Metropolitan Air Airports Commission. The proposed action that we're seeing is the Metropolitan Council to authorize the Regional Administrator to execute a joint powers agreement with the Metropolitan Airports Commission, the Airport Police Department, for an amount not to exceed $708,000 for law enforcement assistance to the Council along that allows additional police presence on the Blue Line LRT. A little bit of a background that's in the business item here, as uh, the chief has talked about at the Committee of the Whole in many presentations, the police department still struggles with staffing numbers. What this JPA is allowing us to do is to allow additional police presence on the Blue Line LRT, specifically with the MAC here around the airport. Um, the little bit of the rationale with that, again, as we look at the joint powers agreements and the state statute and uh, council policy, we need uh, council action to exercise a joint powers agreement, and this joint powers agreement has a dollar amount associated with it, so we'd ask for approval for that. Um, we have done a Thrive Lens analysis on this. Uh, funding is being funded through the Metro Transit Operating Budget, and we did review with uh, OEO about the small business inclusion. Since this is a government agency, there's no uh, impact with that. With that, I'd take questions if there's any. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? Councilmember Cameron. Yeah, so, um... You know, as as I have stated before in this committee and in other committees, um, you know, I really appreciate seeing these joint power agreements um, as opportunities to collaborate with our partners. Certainly, as the um, Met Council representative to the MAC, this is really important um, <clears throat> to have um, this as as one of our first touch points as people use our transit system. Uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask, um, really, in understanding this, um, how this specific JPA will work is, um, you know, in terms of the responsibilities of um, charging, uh, how, how is that determined? Um, you know, is it the person, is it the officer um, who, who is present at the, at the time, or is, it, is that handed off then to a different department, or how, how will that work? Chair Barber, Council Member Cameron, thank you for that question. Um, the Chief has mentioned this at the Committee of the Whole and some of the presentations. We're going to have more joint powers agreements as they're being renewed, so we do anticipate some more JPA agreements coming forward to this committee and the Council. This specific agreement, uh, I'll let Captain Raymond speak about patrol operations, but really specific to the operations of what hours the airport PD is providing services. Um, I, you know, I'll let Captain Raymond speak to the specifics of it, but it really should be that extra coverage that's down there, and then we pick up the extra half of the day. I don't know if you want to talk about the specific hours or. Yeah, Chair, Council Members, uh, Council Member Cameron, yeah, thank you. Uh, so we work uh, very closely with the airport and have a, uh, a, a long, uh, strong relationship with them. And so that, that this joint power agreement really uh, has them covering typically from hours of 4 a.m. to noon, and then we cover the rest. Uh, so Typically, what it is is if we are there, we will be primary, and we will take on the charging there. If the airport police officers are there and they witness it and they handle that, they will typically take take the charging on their end as well. Is usually how it works in the airport locations. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Vento. Thank you, Madam Chair. I I don't know that I've said this to you folks before, but I know I've said it to my colleagues before. I have a brother who lives in downtown Minneapolis and frequents. Um, light rail to and from the airport and has raved about the quality and just feeling very safe. He had one incident recently where I don't know if the person was agitated or what was going on, but there was a passenger who was um, intimidating folks and my brother could tell that one of the passengers was pretty frightened and so he made a point of moving over and sitting next to her and then paging or communicating for assistance and when they got to the next stop there was a Met Transit police officer there and everything was taken care of in a really calm sort of way and he was just totally impressed with that and I just want you to know that um, for all the criticism that is out there from time to time about safety on transit he's had a great experience in his travels to and from the airport so thank you to you and your colleagues. Thank you. Good. Uh, additional questions or comments? I would just echo Councilmember Cameron. I think this is great, and I think that it shows really our continued holistic approach to try and address some of our safety and security needs on our transit system. So appreciate all the creativity and work that's gone into it. 
All right. Okay, um, then I would entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-180. So moved. Second. Moved by Councilmember Cameron, second by Councilmember Vento. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those nay, motion carries, thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're on to the rest, our business in regular order now. Um, it's business item 2023-58, which is the Metro Blue Line Extension 2023 through 2024 Capital Grant Agreement. And we have uh, Nick Thompson and Chris Beckham's here. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council Members. So this is uh, business item 2023-58, and this is the item that we met with you last, a week ago today, um, to do an info item on. So it is the capital grant agreement for the Blue Line Extension Project. It is from Hennepin County and Hennepin County Regional Railroad Authority. And just a reminder that this uh, this agreement is in, will have a new governance model, so we will have a project decision board that is made up of council members and of uh, Hennepin County commissioners that will make decisions on the project moving forward. And we can uh, develop that or convene that board once this agreement is approved. Um, they will make major project decisions. We also have an integrated project team that will continue. We have one now and that will continue um, integrated staff within the project office. Um, and then it also clarifies the financial uh, responsibilities between the two entities. Um, it also um, strengthens those governance and management structures and then streamlines processes and better aligns with the Federal Transit Administration requirements. And it really does maximize efficiency for all partners. Um, I've nego negotiated a number of these agreements while working at the council. And this was a really collaborative discussion for the last nine months or so with our county partners. And we're really excited to implement the new um, terms of this agreement and, and the partnership that goes along with it. So the proposed action before you today is that the Met Council would authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute the 2023 and 2024 Blue Line Extension Capital Grant Agreement number 22I038 with Hennepin County and HICRA in the amount not to exceed 75,305,000 and to issue the limited notice to proceed number two to the engineering services contract 22P103A to advance the design plans and complete the municipal consent process. And I should mention that the LNTP, the limited notice to proceed, is something we added into this business item after our discussion last week as a way to further control the advancement of this um, particular contract. So we would issue that LNTP, advance the work, and then come back to this body um, before we would advance further beyond uh, design and municipal consent. So I will stand for any questions. And Madam Chair and Council Members, in, in addition to that, after this item is a budget item to bring in the full amount of the grant. But as Chris mentioned, the LNTP is really the control mechanism that uh, bring will have us brought back for you. But Hennepin County is awarding the full grant to us, so we need to accept the full grant funds. But, but the LNTP puts some controls over how they are spent and when we come back to you as a board to provide an update on whether uh, through the municipal consent process and clearly we'll update on enterprise risks and other items related to the project as as we have and to follow our new transit way advancement policy. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from council members? Hmm. Council member Chambliss. Well, thank you for the presentation and you know, I know there have been many people in discussions over the last six months, including myself, and I'm uh, glad we we're able to get to this point. Uh, and so, just really excited about that. I mean, it it, um, it also has a lot of extra components in terms of how we manage our projects and how we partner with other entities. So that's that's also very positive. Additional questions or comments, Councilmember Vento. Um, first. Thank you both, and thank you, Chris, that um, that um, project decisions board model is excellent, and I, <laughs> I wish we had had something similar to that for all of our projects. I think it would help a lot. Um, and the thing that, that sticks out to me in the wording in the documents you prepared for us is that it emphasizes partnership, collaboration, shared decision making. Um, that's been the process all along, but if you were to go to the Minnesota legislature or to almost any media organization, 
you wouldn't think there was any partnership collaboration or shared decision making. You'd think that it was all being done by the Met Council because that's the way it reads in most articles and on most TV segments about it. Um, it's how it's been portrayed in, in many legislative meetings. And I, for one, am um, kind of tired of that. And I'm also um, not willing to put up with it a whole lot longer. I have said this out loud to individuals, but I've never said it out loud to a group. I'm wondering when Hennepin County is going to be asked some questions about projects they've been involved in. Um, it's all been laid at the feet of the Met Council, and this just cannot continue to happen. It's not how it, it was supposed to happen, and it's not how it should be happening. Uh, with regard to this project, I do have concerns about the opposition and unanswered questions that continue to be out there about displacement. Um, the Channel 5 and Channel 11 segments that were done, Channel 5's was last week. I saw one last night on Channel 11. They leave a lot of unanswered questions, and again, they put it all at our feet. There's no mention of, of um, the involvement of the county, at least not in the segments I saw. So I, I am really having a struggle with this and would hope that we can get as many, um, as many answers as possible because this is very difficult, particularly for people whose lives are going to be uprooted in terms of housing displacement and business displacement. Um, we've seen it in other situations, but this one is a particular concern to me. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the impact on BIPOC communities and hope that, that the county and the communities are really willing to stand up front with us on this if this goes forward because we just can't continue to be taken to task for a project that was designed at the local level. Thank you, Madam Chair. Any additional questions or comments? All right, seeing and hearing none, I entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-58. Move. Moved by Councilmember uh, Dolcar. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Chambliss. Any other discussion? Uh, Council members, I'm going to let you know that I'm going to be voting no on this item tonight. This time, I don't believe that the enterprise risk that we had talked about at our prior meeting are mitigated enough that in a way that's going to benefit the entire region and the regional transit system. I'm taking this position not only as the chair of the transportation committee, but the representative of District 4. Uh, the current place we're in, I feel we can potentially negatively impact the transit expansion in all of the other counties, including the, those that I represent. I will say I'm fully committed to um, providing transit in communities along the proposed Blue Line corridor. However, I don't think it's really prudent or responsible to advance this at this time. Very appreciative of the project office and Hennepin County staff who have negotiated a very sound and very good capital grant agreement. I do think it really, really sets the standard for things going forward. So I want you to know that I recognize that. Um, it's a lot of great work that you did. And I do think it does send the standard going forward. Of course, I want everyone to act in, as they see appropriate on the business item. I just wanted you to be aware of where I was thinking at this time. So with that, um, if there's no other discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 No. 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 And the motion carries. Next, we're on to business item number 2023-179, the, uh, the joint 2023 budget amendment piece. Good afternoon, Chair Committee members. Ed Petrie, Director of Finance, Metro Transit. I'm here to present 2023-179-JT. Uh, it's a 2023 budget amendment, special August transportation amendment. Uh, this amendment is authorizing the $75,305,000 of county funding for the capital grant agreement with Hennepin County and Hennepin County Regional Railroad Authority for the period of September 1, 2023 to, through December uh, 31st of 2024. And with that, Madam Chair, committee members, I'd stand for any questions. Very good. Any questions? All right, and entertain a vote, uh, motion to approve business item 2023-179-JT. So moved. Moved by Councilmember Cameron. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by Councilmember Carter. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. 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 And the motion carries. Thank you. 
Next, we are on to business item 2023-176, which is the Metro Greenland Extension Aldridge Parsons Joint Venture Part 1 Claims Resolution Change Order. And we have Jim Alexander here to present. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee members. Um, so I have a presentation that's going to cover both uh, uh, 176 and 177. Um, so I'll pause uh, after we get through 176 here. Um, advance my slide here. So just to give you a little background on the uh, two contracts. We're talking about the civil construction contract and the, uh, and the systems construction contract for the Green Line extension. And for the civil, this is the breakdown. I think I've showed this slide uh, numerous times to folks, um, just the scope here of what the contractor is building, the civil contractor. And then the, followed by the systems contractor. So essentially the civil work gets done and the systems uh, continues. And uh, maybe we can give you an update uh, on construction later on this, this, uh, this quarter here. But uh, uh, overall, the, uh, the, the uh, c civil contract is about uh, a little over, a little over uh, 80, it's close to 80% complete, uh, mostly out west, uh, still working on the tunnel. The tunnel is around 55%. That's the Kenilworth LRT tunnel in Minneapolis. And the systems contractor is really just getting underway. So they're probably a little under 10% out in the field. Although we do have that storage change order we've talked about in the past where they're continuing to manufacture equipment and store and be ready for installation. But uh, maybe a little breakdown on the systems contract. Uh, we have traction power substation. You can see up the upper photo there. This is uh, out of Southwest Station. The overhead contact system essentially brings that power from the traction power to the, uh, to the line. Uh, down below, you can see some imaging of the uh, contact wire getting in place uh, near Southwest Station again. Tunnel facilities, uh, providing fans and uh, other other uh, workings inside the Kenilworth Tunnel, and uh, communication and signaling systems. So construction progress overall, the project as a whole is uh, is over seventy five percent complete, and that includes light rail vehicles and uh, the the work we did out at Franklin, uh, the you know, operation maintenance facility. So the, off to the left here is a uh, image of the uh, Kenilworth LRT Tunnel under construction near the. Uh, the Cedar Isles condominium uh, uh, buildings. And uh, <coughs> on the right is uh, work on a traction power substation out in Minnetonka. So we're gonna talk about uh, a settlement agreement that we had uh, um, uh, put underway with civil, con civil contractor LMJV, London Across and Joint Venture. And uh, the reason why we had that settlement agreement is that we had to add approximately 34 months to the construction contract. Uh, once we were through with that, we uh, negotiated with the systems contractor to add similar time uh, to, to that work. And that, uh, that additional time was required due to, uh, due to uh, uh, several significant change orders to the project that uh, been exposed to the quarter protection wall. You've heard of that uh, up on the uh, eastern part of the project. Uh, issues related to the Kenilworth Tunnel itself. Uh, we also added a station, Eden Prairie Town Center station to the, uh, to the mix. And uh, so we negotiated that with the uh, civil contractor to add time because of those, those issues. And uh, I'll talk about the settlement agreements as we, uh, as we uh, move forward here. I did also want to add that uh, we, uh, we continue to forecast a, a revenue service of uh, 27. So that's still, uh, that's still in the works here. So overall project schedule and cost, uh, the two uh, bubbles on the, uh, on the left uh, relate to that, that work with the settlement agreement. We, again, we added about three, four and a half months to the civil construction schedule. And that was completed with the settlement agreement back in January of, of 22. Now that carried, um, uh, with that settlement agreement, it carried issues known up to December 31st, 2021. And then we, uh, we uh, resolved, uh, uh, similar issues with the systems contractor uh, through that uh, through that period, and we have schedules in place. I would note that uh, both of these do not include these schedules do not include the uh, delays that we had experienced with the secant uh, uh, um, uh, secant wall work at the Kenilworth Tunnel, and we're currently working with the contractors to determine that uh, that uh, the impact to that. A little background. Uh, back in January, uh, the council did approve uh, 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 the uh, approved the idea of negotiating, and executing the settlement agreement with LMJB to resolve cost disputes related to that additional 34 months. And uh, 
it also uh, entered into a, a process called a dispute resolution process, the uh, acronym ADR, and I'll walk through that in a little bit. But the settlement agreement established a minimum value for resolving the disputes in the amount of 210 million. And coupled with that is the contractor identified a cap of 288 million, uh, which again was established through for issues through that uh, December 31, 2021 time period. Similarly, the systems construction contract, uh, we, uh, the council approved early in March uh, to add uh, supplemental conditions to the, uh, to the contract to extend the contract time and to address uh, claims for the costs associated with additional time through that ADR process. And this included a cap of 64 million from the systems contractor uh, to uh, resolve issues up to that December 31, 21. So a little bit about the alternative disputes resolution process. This is a, this is a process that we've set in place to uh, resolve extended performance costs. And those are costs the contractor uh, will incur because they are on the job longer. So essentially that 34 and a half months, they, they will experience some costs uh, due to that. There's also associated labor and material escalation costs uh, as we uh, progress through time and associated subcontractor costs. Now with the civil contractor only, we, had, uh, we also have, uh, have some closeout uh, of known change orders and productivity impacts up to that uh, December 31, 2021. And I would wanna note that uh, we have been utilizing nationally recognized uh, experts. We have uh, legal counsel, uh, Venable is, uh, is helping us with this uh, process. We also have uh, construction claims and accounting experts uh, assisting with us with, with assisting us with as well. Um, Troner and Whipley are the two firms. All three of these firms have been, uh, were involved in, uh, in the uh, cost resolution uh, for the MnDOT St. Croix uh, bridge crossing a few years ago. So we do have experience on the national front and from the local perspective as well. So the steps that are involved with the ADR process here, we first uh, look to do step negotiation. That's really s sitting at the business table to resolve issues with the, with, with the, uh, the contractor. Now, what leads up to that is our experts will be looking at uh, bid information and other, other information to help uh, identify what is a legitimate cost. And we will assess that and eventually negotiate uh, a final cost with the contractor. If we don't come to an agreement uh, through that process, then it goes through an evaluative mediation process where we uh, bring our case uh, to a mediator as well as the contractor does as well. And we look to get resolutions through that process. If that doesn't uh, lead to a conclusion, uh, the parties will go to uh, non-binding uh, or sorry, binding arbitration. So the first uh, item, the business item uh, dash 176 relates to the, to the systems contractor, APJB Aldrich Parsons joint venture. <coughs> now there are three items associated with this particular uh, item tonight. Uh, the first is uh, we're looking to um, uh, get approval for a part one change order. And then there's the associated increase in the cumulative change order authority. We talked about that in the past, like for example, back in July, there was the, uh, you may recall the Traction Power Foundation um, business item we brought forward. And third is the ability to issue more than one <coughs> part one change order. As we look to resolve issues under that $64 million cap, we wanna take pieces at a time to get, as we get them resolved or bring them to conclusion. And if it's over two and a half million dollars, we would bring that to this board for approval. And we may have a subsequent uh, 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 approval, seeking approval for the uh, cumulative authority uh, increases <coughs> where needed. So the first item, the, uh, the part one change order uh, relates to uh, uh, primarily the, uh, the, uh, the expenses that Aldrich and Parsons are going to be experiencing uh, for the extended time. So we're talking about extended management, we're talking about labor and uh, management labor and, uh, and, uh, and, and equipment costs uh, over, over that uh, time of the 34 months. We're looking to uh, get approval to execute a part one change order in an amount not to exceed uh, $20 million, $380,680 there. And, the, and this would include a payment mechanism for claims resolved in the ADR process. And uh, again, this, was, uh, with this amount has been determined um, with the support of our legal counsel, Venable, and the uh, construction claims and accounting experts uh, with uh, Troner and Whipley. 
I should note that the uh, the 20 million is in our current estimated budget as well. So the second piece is the cumulative change order authority, kind of a busy table here, but it walks through uh, where the original contract uh, had started at just over 194 million. And then uh, it includes the, uh, the council approved uh, uh, item back in July to uh, increase it up to 30, almost 34 million. And the value of the change orders executed through early August here is uh, just under 15 million. And so the current balance uh, remaining cumulative authority is just uh, over 19 million. With that change order that uh, we, uh, we sought and received approval on the, the traction power substations for the foundations there, that uh, if you take away that four and a half million and then also take away the additional uh, a change order authority we're requesting with this item, which essentially is equivalent to that part one value of just over $20 million, we would have, we would have ultimately uh, a change order authority remaining of about uh, $14,710,000. Uh, so the third item is to um, authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute an amendment to the supplemental conditions that came forward earlier in March. Uh, the reason being is that we want to add uh, the ability to seek a, a multiple part one change orders as we're moving through the process. And I'll give you an example of that. There's, sub, there's subcontractor uh, costs that we still haven't addressed yet. So we look at that as, a, as another item we, pr we likely bring. If we can bring the bulk of the subcontractors to this body, we will do so or maybe a portion of that. So this just adds uh, more flexibility uh, for us to uh, continue the negotiation process to get to resolution of the ultimate amount. So Madam Chair, committee members, the, uh, the proposed action here is a little lengthy here, but I'll go through it. Um, that the Met Council authorize the regional administrator as part of the system schedule cost claims resolution process, negotiate and execute a part one change order for contract 17P000 with Aldrich Parsons, a joint venture in an amount not to exceed $20,388,680. $20, also to authorize an additional 10.49% uh, to the current 17.48% uh, percent cumulative change order authority for the same contract with APJB resulting in 27.97% cumulative change order authority and authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute an amendment to the 810 supplemental conditions for rebaseline system schedule cost claims resolution to modify the payment process to allow more frequent payment of resolved claims. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll pause for any questions. Thank you, Jim. Questions or comments? I know it's a lot. So, Councilmember Cameron, then Councilmember Vento. Um, so we're, uh, I think, just could you clarify where this leaves us in terms of that eighty-four? Um, is it eighty? Yeah, eighty-four million uh, dollar cap for APGV. JV. Sure, uh, yeah. I'm sure, Councilmember. Well, the the cap uh, set by the contractor is sixty-four million. Okay. And so this twenty million would be <laughs> part of that. A subset of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Vento. I'm fine, thanks. Okay. Additional questions or comments? Um, uh, Councilmember Chambliss. Yeah, on page um, <coughs> page 12, the balance of the cumulative change order authority at 14 million seven. Um, how do we know that that is going to be sufficient? Um, what is our confidence level that we may or may not burn through that number? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, I can tell you that uh, we'll likely be back to uh, seek uh, additional cumulative authority. It will depend on the amount of subsequent part ones that we bring forward. So as you can imagine, we've got uh, 20 million of this part one of, uh, it could be as much as 64 million. There's still there's still some area there that we would be, uh, we would be uh, looking to seek authority on. So likely with another part one, if it's over two and a half million, we will likely be back to ask for more authority on the cumulative change order amount. And we'll just have to advise you as we, as we proceed through that. To give you an idea of the, of the ordinary uh, change orders on the mm -hmm. contract, we've, uh, 
we have just under 15 million of uh, change orders on a $194 million contract. And about 9 million of that was to the storage piece. So we have about, uh, we had about uh, six, well, short of $6 million in actual change orders. So the contracts uh, with uh, Met Council's process, it starts with 10% of the original contract value. And so we'll just have to, we're trying to gauge that as we move through this process that we will, we will likely come back for more authority uh, approval. That's Mark Cameron. Um, and could you remind us at what, what percentage of the civil uh, contractor's work is completed at this time in the project? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Member, I'm gonna go off. I didn't research this, but I think it's around 80%. It's uh, probably a little under 80%. Uh, primarily things are, uh, are getting fairly wrapped up on the west end from Shady Oak on down uh, to Eden Prairie to the Southwest Station. Um, it's really areas in Minneapolis that still have, have some work to do. And like I say, the tunnel is just around 55% and that's the long lead item on this project. That's from Cameron. I meant systems. <laughs> oh, systems. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm, thinking, uh, I'm thinking it's around 10% uh, in the field. Um, well, overall, at, uh, as far as uh, payment goes, it's probably closer to uh, a little over 50% because the contractor continues to build those truck traction power substations and the signal houses and get them stored. So they're ready to go when we are ready to install. Okay, any additional questions or comments? All right, seeing and hearing none, I entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-176. So moved. Moved by Council Member Cameron, seconded by Council Member Dokar. Um, is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, and the motion carries. Turn it back to you, Jim. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. So this next item is business item in 2023-177. Just a little intro here of that, uh, of that item here. And so what we're looking to do is uh, is to seek an increase in the settlement uh, agreement value. Uh, so we, again, we have our same uh, experts that uh, have been helping us on the, uh, on the system contract and we have uh, resolved costs totaling approximately $209.9 million. Recall that we have authority up to 210 million under that $288 million cap identified by the contractor. So the cost categories resolved to date include um, a re resolution of 194 change orders, additional overhead costs, productivity impacts, and associated subcontractor costs. So we're seeking tonight an increase in to the not exceed value in the amount of 75 million. And that's required to resolve remaining cost categories outlined in the original settlement agreement, including but not limited to labor and material escalation, compensability of a four month delay, I'll pause on there for a moment. So we have identified with our consultants that uh, the council would be responsible for 30 of those 34 and a half months. And the contractor believes that, uh, that uh, we would be responsible all 34 and a half months. And so there still needs to be resolved that, uh, that delta. So that's a piece that our consultants are helping us with. Uh, also uh, relates to impacts to excavation to the Kenilworth Tunnel and additional bonds and insurance associated with the delay. <coughs> So when I say the impacts to the excavation of the Kenilworth Tunnel, that relates to secant delays that we experienced in 22 and 23. If you recall that well, we had uh, experienced some, uh, some issues with the, uh, the Sika Cedar Isles Condominium Association Tower, the 10-story tower, where there's some separation that occurred as we were installing the secant uh, piles. That issue has since been resolved, but the contract had, go, had to go on pause during that uh, resolution, and that took up... Uh, uh, well into into the summertime where it occurred in January. We also had a subsequent uh, subsequent uh, delays due to other issues around the Sika area that we had to contend with. So with this $75 million additional uh, value, we, we will remain under the contractor's cap uh, of $280 million that's identified in the agreement. So the 75 million is also uh, uh, will allow us to rent uh, to re resolve additional matters related to the uh, civil construction, primarily the secant delays, and uh, <clears throat> the 75 million is in our current current budget. Uh, 
Now, a portion of that 75 million is going to be attributed to the existing delays up through December 21, 31, 2021, as well as issues that uh, were experienced in 22 and 23. I just can't uh, divulge the, the the split of that uh, because we're in negotiation right now. I just don't want to compromise our negotiation position, but uh, be assured that we are under the $280 million cap. And uh, once we do get those issues resolved, we will come back to you to to talk about how that's going to how that's going to play out. So, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, council members, I uh, have a proposed action that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to increase the not to exceed value of the settlement agreement. Uh, council contract uh, number 22M013 with London Macross and Joint Venture in the amount of 75 million for a total new not to exceed amount of 285 million and to make future payments as defined in the agreement. So, with that, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, I'll pause for any questions. Very good. Thank you, Jim. Questions or comments? Councilmember Cameron. Uh, I'll just say thank you uh, to the uh, project leads and staff for working on this so diligently um, because I know that it's been a difficult process going through the settlement agreement. So I just want to thank them for their time and their diligence um, and commitment to getting this right. So thank you. I echo that. Well said. Um, additional questions or comments? All right. Seeing and hearing none, I entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-177. So, so moved. Moved by Councilmember Tony <coughs> Carter. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Councilmember Tyrone Cutter. Is there any other discussion? <coughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion carries. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Um, next, we're on to business item 2023-174. Uh, joint committee item is the 2023 Unified Budget Amendment for the third quarter. And we have Ed Petrie and Heather um, Peasel here to present. Good afternoon, committee members. Ed Petrie, Director of Finance, Metro Transit. Hi, good afternoon. Heather Giesel, um, Director of Finance and Administration for CD and MTS. And we are here to present the third quarter budget amendment. Uh, it's 2023-174 JT. This is one of our largest amendments or larger amendments during the year as we're bringing in a lot of the federal monies that we've been applying for with the federal government, bringing those, funny, those monies in to match the projects that were approved in the council adopted CIP. So I will go through the portion uh, pertaining to Metro Transit. I'll do both capital and operating, answer any questions, then move it on to Heather for MTS. So for the Metro Transit family of projects or projects on the amendment, first of all, we have a few projects that we are closing and are reallocating funding. Projects have come to a close. There's some money left, so we're moving into other projects of like scope. This is something we do with every budget amendment. But the largest portion of our, of our amendment is bringing monies into the capital budget. Uh, as monies are becoming available, both federal, state, and RTC funds. A uh, number of the projects that we are, adjust, are recommending for adjustment this evening are bringing federal funding, funding and state funding into the, uh, in from the legislature into a number of projects, including the E-Line, F-Line, G-Line, H-Line, and the Gold Line BRT. Uh, we also have a number of projects that were in the CIP, also that where funding is now available, including the purchase of buses, uh, facility energy conservation projects, hoist replacement, ADA bus stops, and some safety improvements, uh, Green Line OMF LRV storage buildings, our storage building, LRV state of good repair projects to maintain our LRVs in a state of good repair, which would include brakes, corrosion mitigation, and overhaul maintenance, uh, some funds for the fare collection system upgrade and fare box replacement, uh, variable message signs, uh, various customer and support facility improvements, uh, the Haywood Campus Administrative B uh, Building Renovations, uh, the BPSI Business System uh, Process System Integration Project. Uh, total for uh, Metro Transit, it's bringing in just over $131 million in federal funds, one, approximately $130 million in state funds, and $42 million in RTC. That will be the match for the federal dollars. And with that, Madam Chair, committee members, that's the portion for the Metro Transit uh, CIP, this is what this is basically our largest amendment of the year, and it's standard every year that when with federal funds are available, we bring the projects in. Now it's stand for any questions. Thank you, Ed. Questions or comments from council members? All right, turn it back to you guys. Okay. 
Then we have then the operating side for Metro Transit. Now a few different items. First of all, we're recognizing $2 million in state appropriations. We received this past legislative session uh, for grants for the Transit Service Intervention Project. Uh, as I mentioned, we are bringing the BPS project, BPSI project into the capital budget. We had originally budgeted $1,861,000 on the operating side. That project is now moving over to the capital side. So we're <laughs> relieving then $1,861,000 out of the operating budget. Uh, the council also received $3 million in state appropriations for the highway, the BRT transit development on, on Highway 169 and Highway 55 corridors. We're receiving these $3 million, $250,000 a year, or a month rather. We'll receive about uh, $1.5 million in calendar year 2023. We're still working on the scope of what that project is, but we'll be bringing the funds in, putting them into reserve until we're ready to spend them. But we'll be re receiving about $1.5 million of that money in calendar 23. Uh, this, as we had also previously discussed, this uh, memo will also remove the county funding for the Metro Blue Line, Green Line, and North Star Commuter Rails uh, for the, the counties of Hennepin, Anoka, Ramsey, and Dakota. If you recall with the legislature with the passage of the sales tax, effective October, 20, October 1st, 2023, thereafter, the county's portion of their contribution for subsidies now being replaced with the sales tax. So this is recognizing the 2023 portion of that. It's approximately $9.6 million. And with that, Madam Chair, committee members, I'd stand for any questions. Thank you. Questions or comments? All right. Um, Council Member Cameron. So this is the new project portion of the uh, budget amendment that you just went through. I think um, this is more of a comment, uh, but you know, uh, there are a significant number of uh, changes to the budget, and I think um, I don't want to speak on behalf of other council members, but having um, a greater presentation to kind of walk through not all of the projects, but give us a sense for some of the larger scale, for some of the where there's a larger scale change request to make sure that we have that information before us because um, it's uh, right now, it's difficult to discern which has, uh, um, you know, there's notes about uh, federal funding, but which which are, uh, in terms of scale, which have the larger scale changes versus the smaller uh, items for the budget. That's all. Okay, Chair, committee members, an attached, in addition to the business item, there is also an attachment three that should be attached to your business item. And that's a large worksheet that shows all the projects that are changing. Yeah. It shows the beginning scope and then what we're recommending for change and then lists it by then federal funds, state, our other funds or RTC money, and then brings you to the total authorization. Okay. So that gives you then the idea or the flavor of the total change and what the components of the funding mixes are. Thank you. No That's very oh, I just needed to keep scrolling. That was yeah. <laughs> As Ed said, this is the biggest one of the year, yes. so it's a lot of information, right. and uh, and we were fully cognizant of it. And and as you look through the attachments, there's if there is a different way to present it, um, there's a lot of detail on the business item. But you know, we definitely welcome to whatever feedback. And one of the things I would add here, you know, this is you know this it's very confusing. That's why we attach that table. But also on that table on the far right hand side, then let's say we're bringing in a project for a million dollars. It'll show how much we're planning to spend in 2023, and then the multi-year authorization. So it gives you the full scope, breadth of the 2023, and then the life of the project. Okay. Additional questions and comments so far. All right, turn it back to you guys. Yeah. Uh, so transitioning to the MTS portion of the amendment, uh, so first in the administrative adjustment section, uh, we're repurposing existing funding that's already in the authorized capital program to complete eight projects. Uh, additionally, six Southwest Transit projects are complete or funding has been reduced and remaining funds have been reallocated to their undesignated account for future programming. Uh, as a quick reminder, there's no formal action for you to take on these administrative adjustments tonight. Uh, but we have included the adjustments for transparency and for accounting purposes. Uh, next, in the authorized new project section, MTS is requesting to bring into the ACP just under $6.3 million in, in RTC for a variety of projects that have been identified in our capital improvement plan. Uh, they include METMO and fixed route uh, technology replacement, METMO small bus expansion, <coughs> and the MTS portion of the council's BPSI project, as Ed had mentioned. Um, in his presentation. 
Uh, the final uh, new project reallocates $2 million in MBTA funds to provide additional support for capital improvements to the MBTA uh, Burnsville bus garage. Uh, additionally, staff have identified eight projects totaling $2.9 million uh, that are in our ACP that are fully expensed and can be closed. Uh, the remaining RTC from these projects will be repurposed and made available for existing or future projects. I can now stand for any questions on the capital side. Great. Questions or comments from council members? All right, back to you. Uh, moving on to the operating side of the amendment, um, we're authorizing a total of 2.8 million in reserve funding to cover service provider contractor increases uh, for contracts that were amended at the end of 2022 um, for transit link, METMO, and contracted services to, uh, or fixed route. Uh, to raise driver wages and align with Metro Transit increases that happened last fall as well. Um, finally, the amendment includes $9 million in pass-through budget for demand response microtransit service grants to the suburban transit providers. Uh, the funding was identified in the 2023 transportation bill as a specific use of the new sales tax. Uh, the funds will be passed through to the regional providers via grant agreements. Um, this amendment demonstrates commitment toward asset preservation and supports the thrive outcome of stewardship by assessing future needs, responsible planning, and management of financial resources for Metro Transit and Metropolitan Transportation Services. Um, our requested action is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the 2023 Unified Budget Amendment as indicated and in accordance with the attached tables. And then I'm happy to answer any uh, questions on the operating budget or any broader questions for the two of us. Very good, thank you. All right, any additional questions or comments from council members? All right, then I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2023-174-JT. Motion to approve. Moved by council member Chambliss. Is there a second? Second. Second by council member Vento. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Thank and you. Heather, appreciate it. Um, and that actually does conclude our business for the evening. I think all but the first item we heard about the um, uh, joint powers agreement came, we'll have to go non-consent to the full council as long as everyone agrees. Yep, yep very good. All right, um, so now we are on to um, our information item for the evening, which is the quarterly service changes and workforce update. And we have Adam Harrington, Brian, Brian Funk, and Je Jessica Cross here to present. <coughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. Um, I'm going to let Brian start this one out, and then we'll move through these topics. Uh, a lot of good news that we're going to share with you today. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon again, Madam Chair, Council Members, Brian Funk, uh, Chief Operating Officer. Pleasure to be here today. As Adam indicated, we have some uh, great news to share with you, uh, both on the operator hiring front, our changes for the upcoming service changes, and then plans for the uh, state fair that will be shared by Jessica. Um, here's our uh, typical look at our bus operator snapshot data. And so what this is showing us is that uh, we currently have slightly more staff than what we're targeting for August, even with adding service back into our service plan. And so uh, as Adam will describe, uh, we've been uh, consistently adding back service hours, trying to keep up and induce additional demand. Uh, and the good news is that uh, our actuals right now uh, do not yet include people that we have uh, both as student bus operators, you can see that we have about 37 people who are currently in training. Um, and then plus we have uh, a little over 500 uh, applicants who are still working through the process. And so uh, things are looking really strong when it comes to bus operator hiring, thanks to the moves that we made last fall, uh, ongoing uh, excellent outreach and, and work that's being going on uh, with our staff in operations and human resources. And so. Um, we've had uh, 276 folks start with us. Uh, of course, not everybody uh, is able to complete the training, but the uh, vast majority are. That 276, uh, when we then uh, take out people who have received promotions, new jobs, retirements, otherwise uh, leaving service with transit, uh, has a net increase of about 100 operators so far for this year. And so uh, that's very strong, and that's what's really allowing us to add back the service. And you can see on the chart, uh, start to bend that uh, back in a positive direction. So uh, this is really good. Uh, if you recall, early in the year, we started a new uh, paid commercial learners permit program 
uh, where we bring people in for a week to be able to start their career with us before they have that critical permit. Uh, that's a really high success uh, program. We knew that once we got it started, uh, it would be a hit, and so far we're hitting at almost 90% success uh, through that program. And so uh, that's a really good way that people start to learn about Metro Transit. Again, they're receiving pay to get that critical permit uh, that we need before they can start in the classroom. Uh, and as I mentioned, ongoing outreach and marketing. Uh, we have uh, buses and billboards and uh, staff who are uh, hitting the communities. This past Saturday, we had another uh, what we call one day hiring event where people can come in and interview uh, for those positions. Uh, 65 people came in on a beautiful Saturday uh, because they were in interested and motivated in joining the team. So we're really happy about that. Uh, and building on the success of the bus operators uh, is the train operator snapshot. Uh, you've heard a little bit about um, you know, our challenges there. You can see on the red line in the chart is a decrease, and when we have such a small pool um, of operators needed to operate our service, it really stretches resources thin. Of course, once we start to bring uh, new candidates in and need to work on training, we need our existing train operators to help with that, and so it's really stretched resources uh, this summer, but we're starting to bend the curve there as well, and so uh, mm -hmm. we're back up to 91 available operators with 95 as our current target for the 15-minute headways. Uh, we have six additional student train operators right now who are scheduled to complete their training in early September. So uh, we'll be back to being uh, what we think is fully staffed. And we have another class actually starting um, in a couple of weeks. And so uh, we're really excited about uh, how this is going. Final thing I'll mention is the internal and external job posting that closes tonight um, at midnight. Uh, we've really, you know, we've pushed that because we want to add stability and resources uh, into our pool, and uh, this number is actually updated. Last week when we put together <coughs> the slides, we had 92 applications, which we were really happy about. Uh, as of this morning, we've had 140 uh, applications uh, to be train operators. Now, that's more total uh, than we would ever uh, need to operate our service um, until we open Southwest, but one of the things that we'll be doing is working with all of the candidates, trying to make sure that people are able to get started with us. And those that we may not have a position as a train operator for, uh, we do have other positions at the organization that need to be filled. And so uh, if they join the team in, say, one of our maintenance positions to get started, they'll jump to the front of the line uh, when we do have train operator positions based on how it's structured in our union contract. So uh, we're really excited about this and hope that it continues to bear out uh, over the next several service changes that we can continue to make investments and add service. And with that, I'll turn it over to Adam. So here's a broader view of what Brian was describing and what you've seen before, showing the, the change over time since 2019 and where we are today. And you see that number it says 75% of August 2019. That's the total system-wide hours that we're operating compared to 2019. And as we move through, uh, you'll see that that is a little bit bigger when we focus in on the core of the service that we're operating. So starting this coming Saturday on the 19th, we will begin improving service on Saturdays and weekdays primarily. This map shows the routes uh, that are going to have service increases on weekdays. A um, number of these also have increases on Saturday as well. And so you can see here that we are really reinvesting service back into routes where we made reductions in the last year. Some of those are supporting and suburban local type routes and others are really those core urban local routes where we're going back up to 10 minute frequency on the core or we're bringing back half hour frequency on some of the suburban routes. So we're really happy to start to strengthen our network as we move forward with our service improvement. So if any of these routes on the map look familiar to you or if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask me after or during this meeting. So just a snapshot on what those routes are and the scale of improvements. So I just broke this out into two different brackets where we're improving to trips every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, and every 30 minutes. And then the last bullet here shows that we're extending Route 801 back over to Brooklyn Center Transit Center from Columbia Heights where we had curtailed it in the last few years. So there's a lot of route numbers on here and we're really happy to have done that. A number of these are Metro Transit operated, a number of these are contracted through MTS at the council. So it's been a great partnership 
between those two workforces to make things come together. Here are the Saturday frequencies. Again, you'll see uh, a variety of routes on here, noting Orange Line is going up to 50 minutes on Saturday, which will be nice. And uh, Route 17 also is going to 15 minutes on Saturday. And I highlight that because the next few slides, I'll talk about our Better Bus Route program a little bit and how Route 17 is part of this package as well. So overall, the August pick, when we think about the type of service that we're operating, as you all know, we've been focusing on our urban and local services and BRT, not so much the Commuter Express. Uh, we're starting to try to get that back over the coming months ahead of us. But right now, just for Metro Transit service alone, it's 86% of BRT and local bus service compared to 2019. If we include our contracted routes, that number is 89% of where we were in 2019. So we're really getting close to full strength, as it were, for our, our local services. And as Brian talked about with LRT, the only thing holding us back right here on that number, 67% is operators. And so we're hoping that we can change that over the coming months uh, as we move ahead. Better Bus Routes, this is our fifth Better Bus Route project, and our goal with this program is to select urban routes where we can improve the speed and reliability of that service. So the map on here shows where the Route 17 operates, and each one of those little circles on there represents a bus stop, and if it's red, it's going to be removed. If it's green, it stays, and if it's blue, it's new. Uh, so our goal here is to improve that reliability of service, and there's a couple ways we measure that. One is, how are we doing today with our on-time performance, and how can we make sure that we can improve it and keep it at a sustainable level so that every trip that we have scheduled meets that schedule as best as possible, and that we're able to provide part of that reliability through how the operator has facilities at the terminal, and we have better bus stop spacing across the whole route. So the name of the game for Route 17 is really improving those terminal locations, better bus stop spacing, and more even frequency and simpler route structure. So we're really excited to have this go into place and to see that improvement uh, for our customers and our operators in particular. It may not show up on the actual timetable right away because we've got some work to regain on improving our reliability on this route, which is why we tackled it. Uh, but we're looking forward to this as well. So as you would expect, when we're removing someone's bus route or bus stop, they might have some concerns. So we had a fairly robust engagement process over the course of the last year or so. When we posted all the bus stops, we got a lot of survey responses from our customers. We talked to operators about what their experience is and what the customer experience is that really helped inform which stops we keep and which stops we would move. And the customer notification is in the stage we're at right now. So each one of the stops is posted. There's info for our customers to reach out to us and comment and ask questions if they have questions about our actions moving forward. So here are the notable changes. Some of the quick stats, we're eliminating 73 bus routes. It sounds like a lot, but 91.5% of all of our customers are going to be within 1 16th of a mile. I don't know how we chose that stat because I don't think we use 1 16th, but 99.5% are within 1 8th of a mile to a bus stop, which is pretty impressive. And uh, I think that just speaks to our ability to try to make this a more reliable route and people's willingness to walk a little bit farther in general from our customer base. Uh, we have some routing changes. The W branch is going to change so that we can move our terminal to Central Avenue, which will be good for our customers and for our bus operators. So it'll be ending at a destination area and retail and a place where our bus operators can use the restroom and uh, get, some, get some snacks as well. ADA pads, it's always an improvement process working with our engineering facilities department. Uh, this just happens to be on this one route where we're improving 17 new ADA pads, which is pretty important, but this happens across the system as well. Uh, and I mentioned a comprehensive schedule update, and uh, if anyone uses a timetable on any route, whether it's a 
you're flying someplace, you want a regular schedule or it's on a bus route, mm -hmm. having that regular increment of time is important for attractiveness and simplicity to our customers. So we're excited about making this implementation and uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to Jessica to talk about the state fair. Even more good news. Madam Chair, Council Members, I'm Jessica Cross. I work in marketing in Metro Transit and I'm in charge of the State Fair this year, uh, which means not just the advertising and promotions, but also uh, helping our express sites get all the signage that they need and um, communicating with customers and, uh, and also working on the exhibits at the State Fair. So the good news this year is that we are adding a fourth park and ride location up in Blaine. That's number one at 95th Avenue Park and Ride. So that's very good news for our northern neighbors. Um, the State Fair was very happy to hear about that. Um, same hours have in the past, and then um, those are the express sites, so those are the ones you paid for. But we also have regular route service. The A-Line will drop you off right on Snelling and the Route 3 on Como, and Route 3 comes from both <coughs> Minneapolis and St. Paul. And so, how are we promoting it? This is the front page of our website, and you can see the, um, the ticketing format. We do um, incentivize electronic payment, so you can show up at the site with cash and pay your $6, but you can also buy on the app or online using eTix, and then it'll just be $5 a ticket. So we're encouraging people to do that. And you can see the newest updated uh, image of the app. So if you see something that doesn't have that turquoise circle, that's not right. <laughs> Oops, no, there we go. So as far as marketing goes, again, this is a lot of what we do all the time. We use our fleet, um, meaning interior cards, exterior ads, we post at our um, bus stops and our stations, interior cars, I think I said that, digital ads, a lot of our pylons, BRT pylons, have little digital ads. Um, we have lots of partner assets that we're able to use, like US Bank Stadium, Prow and Sale, and Excel Center, uh, Marquee. Um, we work with NPR to do a little bit of underwriting. Um, we do advertise with uh, the Star Tribune in their um, State Fair Guide. Um, and then we work with our public relations folks to try to get some earned media, which we usually do. And as I mentioned, we also exhibit at the fair. We are in two locations, not counting the transit turnaround. We are in the grandstand booth. Um, and this year, the display will showcase our transit information tools. We've added some new tools over the past few years, and we've improved some tools. And so this is a little sneak peek of the creative, which is a superhero um, kind of creative. And that actually came from a customer who learned about transit information tools and thought that they had given him extra powers. <laughs> so we worked with that. And as you can see, our mascot, Skip Traffic, swooping in to deliver the transit tool to help the confused customer. Um, so definitely stop by and see it. Uh, and then we're also in the Eco Experience building from A to Green. This is something that we do every year with MnDOT. Um, this is all about air quality. So you can see we've got these cubes in the exhibit where the different partners um, come up with you know, interesting points about you know, saving on infrastructure or money or air quality, things like that. And you can see a little bit, there's a replica bus right next to it where we installed one of our demo bike racks with some instructions there so people can try out the bike rack if they want to. And with that, are there any questions? Thank you. Questions or comments from council members? Council Member Vento. Just want to say thank you for the 219 and the 323 over in the East Metro area and for the State Fair bus from Cottage Grove. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? I just have to say this is great. It's like we had a couple of years where these were always tough conversations that keep getting better and better, you know, uh, down to the number of applications and 88% passing CDL tests. This is These are really good things. And the fact that we're talking about State Fair service in a different way of 
Last year it was, how are we going to do this? And it's a little more of, this is what we're going to do. So it's really got a good feeling to it. All right, any other questions or comments from council members? All right, thank you very much, Saul. And I did not expect we actually dropped an information off tonight because we thought we would go long, but uh, we actually are able to take a little break early. With that, we can be adjourned.